Viktor Petrovich Bryukanov died on October 13, 2021. His heart stopped. He was almost 86 years old. Despite living 30 years after his release from prison, he was never rehabilitated. He and other five convicted Chernobyl workers as well. Hello guys. This time it will probably be a bit longer episode. We are finishing Viktor Bryukanov's story. I think you might hear one or two very strange pieces of information, especially if your insights into Chernobyl are mostly limited to the popular narration and the general pop culture, like HBO's TV series. I don't want to make it too long, so without delaying it further, let's start. Chernobyl Victims The Management Viktor Petrovich Brukanov Part 3 It was April 26, 1986. Chernobyl nuclear power plant's director, Viktor Brukanov, was awakened in the middle of the night by his telephone bell. Automatically, he knew something must have happened. No one would wake him up without a really important reason. He didn't yet know the reason was far more than just important. He received the news and started calling heads of departments and units. No one was picking up the phone at Unit 4, though. He managed to order a meeting in an underground bunker at the Civil Defense Headquarters. All local officials were notified. Victor then jumped into the bus from Pripyat to the power plant. On its way, he had a short time to take a look at the Unit 4 building. Years later, he recalled saying, this is my prison, at that very moment. A year earlier, in 1985, reactor number 3 was undergoing the same test that destroyed reactor number 4. It passed it without noticeable issues. Yet, soon after, it was turned off and taken out for scheduled maintenance, which may sound odd, but was completely normal for the unreliable RBMK reactors. The test was meant to ensure the safety of the reactor in case there was a need to switch the backup diesel generators. These generators had to have enough time to reach the required power output, so the reactor had to work even this additional time if anything happened. If the test failed, the generators would not supply the needed power and the whole reactor could undergo a malfunction or even damage. Overall, these tests were seen as completely routine maintenance tasks, mostly formal ones rather than crucial and serious operations. Nonetheless, the whole Chernobyl nuclear power plant and surrounding areas were shaken by two explosions separated by merely a few seconds. Despite what you may think, especially if you watched HBO's Chernobyl miniseries, Viktor Brukanov was not arrested soon after the disaster happened. He was working at the power plant non-stop and stayed there 24 hours a day. Even though Viktor was a party member and was obeying the political doctrine, he was still a technician and knew a lot about the power plant. He knew the place like his own apartment. And despite we do not know a lot about what precisely he did there, we can imagine he was working on maintaining the accident. Yet, he recalled meeting Boris Sherbina when he arrived in Pripyat the first time. He said to Brukanov, if it were up to me, I would have you shot. During his extended stay at the site of the accident, Victor received a significant dose of ionizing radiation. Some estimates said it was an equivalent of about 200 to 300 x-rays. The annual safety dose is the equivalent of 5 x-rays, so we may guess it was probably a large health issue, if not immediately, surely for his later life. As a direct result of the accident, Brukhanov was expelled from the party, which was far worse than not being a member at all. This meant Victor made some terrible mistakes, or betrayed the ideals. A man having his membership revoked would be constantly reminded of his misfortune. But it was necessary for the Moscow officials. The next step was to summon Brukhanov to the general prosecutor's office. 
they couldn't have their own men being prosecuted for the worst nuclear disaster in human history. Almost four months later, on August 13th, 1986, Victor was taken into custody. Despite the trial took place nearly a year later, you can tell he was a broken man. Of course, living in prison was not easy, yet he was stripped of everything he had. On top of that, his misfortune stretched on his family too. His wife was like a pariah to the general population of the USSR in Pripyat. Even if somebody didn't believe she had to suffer extreme ostracism, he wouldn't do anything out of fear of being identified with Brukhanov. His own mother died when she heard the news of her son being blamed for the Chernobyl disaster. I didn't mention that earlier, but the day he was arrested was also the day of her funeral. He was taken into custody almost immediately after it. His time in prison was like hell. It was the KGB investigative isolator, and he was placed in solitary confinement. Not that he counted on a fair trial, but he wished he would have a defender assigned who could work during that time. That wasn't the case. Even if it was, all the evidence, materials and information about the accident were classified. The trial was getting closer. Victor was accused of many neglections, bad decisions and even lying. One of the most important was the propaganda number, as HBO's Sherbina said. He was accused of reporting intentionally underestimated radiation levels to his superiors, so also to Moscow officials, during the first day of the disaster. However, that was partially true. Years later, voices were being raised that even if he wanted to, Victor couldn't give any estimations on the radiation levels that could be qualified as correct. The reason was simple. The dosimeters they had at Chernobyl and Pripyat at the time were either outdated, not working, or had too small a scale. One of those voices, Ivan Tsarenko, said some time ago in an interview that at least this accusation was completely absurd. Tsarenko, former deputy director of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant for personnel, explained that Brukhanov prepared reports using data given by Korabelnikov, the head of the external dosimetry department. Then, these reports were checked and signed by a physics engineer under the unofficial supervision of the secretary of the station's party committee and the head of the department of the Kiev Regional Committee of the Communist Party. As I already explained several times, the whole USSR system was standing on the chain of responsibility. The lowest level management reported to their supervisors, they reported to their supervisors, and so on, and so on. That's why it was quite brutal in its own way to attribute the underestimated reports only to Brukhanov. Yet, Moscow needed a person to point their finger at. Besides the official narratives, communist and post-communist, there were also other ones. I can include all the workers' and liquidators' memories and statements into one. Another would be the relative's perspective. According to his family, Victor was the first who spoke about evacuating the city. But we can't take it for granted. We can't also put it anywhere on the timeline of events. He could have mentioned it in a conversation, they could have overheard him speaking on the phone. Regardless, it still paints a bit different picture of Viktor Petrovich, right? He was not only a career man and a party member, but also a person who cared about his town and its people. After the trial, which was a pure show-off, he was put on 24-hour watch because the officials were afraid he might harm himself. He was under guard even while using the bathroom. Soon, he was transferred to the first penal colony, then the second. He was highly regarded as though he kept to himself. He still was a pretty skilled technician and manager, so wherever he was transferred to, someone profited from his knowledge. It was not until 1991, when the new USSR's commission admitted officially that the catastrophic proportions of the disaster occurred due to unsatisfactory reactor design. The commission also withdrew a significant portion of the accusations that had been made against the workers and management of the power plant. In the same year, in September, Viktor Brukhanov was released from the prison early, serving about half of his sentence. 
he came back to Chernobyl nuclear power plant and was warmly welcomed. He was even appointed the head of the technical department. During the 20th anniversary of the power plant's official startup, in 1997, in the nearby town of Slavutic, Viktor went to the podium and everybody rose and applauded. He lived long after these events. He worked in different areas of the government, including assignments from the Ministry of Foreign Trade of Ukraine, or serving as a deputy head of Interenergo. He traveled around the world on business trips, including Hungary, Germany and Japan. When he retired, he was ill. The Chernobyl took its toll. Viktor Petrovich Bryukanov died on October 13, 2021. His heart stopped. He was almost 86 years old. Despite living 30 years after his release from prison, he was never rehabilitated. He, another five convicted Chernobyl workers, as well. I hope you liked this video. Let me know in the comment section what would you like to hear about in the next month. Upcoming episodes are already planned and scheduled. And I will have some very interesting news, including a slight change in the content. Well, maybe it won't be a change, but rather an expansion. I hope you will like it too. It will still have Chernobyl in the main spectrum of interest, but from a different angle. That's it for today, guys. Take care. Stay safe. And see you next week.